Just trying to get it so that we have some drawings, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I... Oh, okay. Okay, so now we come to definitions and dimensions. Having a look at the overall view and general ship knowledge, now we nail down to certain technologies and dimensions which will help us go through the naval architecture course. So we have the hull. You see, the hull is the main watertight body of a ship. So that's the hull we see there. As we saw, the bottom, the size, and the deck. That's the main watertight body. That's the one which provides us the buoyancy which enables us to float. All right. So we are seeing two diagrams of it. Looking at it from the top, looking at it from the bottom. But there are portions of the hall with different names. Just like for a human being, the same human being, one portion is called the head, another portion is called the leg, and another portion is called the hand. The hall also have different names for different portions. So when we say forward, we say any place which is toward at or near the front of a ship. So we say when it is near or going towards the front of the ship, then we say you are going forward. If on the other hand you are going towards the back of the ship, then toward at or near the back of a ship refer to as aft. Alright. Then we have the bow. The bow specifically says that the front part of a ship. The forward and bow can be confusing, but the forward simply means we are, you are going towards the front. Aft means you are going towards the aft. And when we say the bow, then it means the actual forward area. And then when we say the stair, then we say the actual aft area. So this is how, but they are usually used interchangeably. So somebody is going to the forward and going to the bow. But this specifically are the definitions for them. All right. So the horn have these names to describe various portions of it. So if I'm standing somewhere here and I'm saying I'm going forward, and you expect me to be moving towards the forward end of the ship. Right. Having said that, now we look at the ship in three dimensions, or three or two, to go now for that's like we do in engineering drawing. For the nautical people, we don't do engineering drawing, but never mind. When we are looking at the projected view of the ship, you can have it in three places. If you are standing ashore and you are looking at a ship passing, the view you will see like this we call the longitudinal view. When you are looking at it from the top, like you are in an aircraft looking at the ship moving, then the view you see we call the water plane area view. And when you are standing behind the ship or in front of it, let's see if it's in the dado, then the view you see we see the transverse view. All right. So longitudinal view is the profile of a ship's horn when viewed lengthwise from shore, from fore to aft. By the transfer is the profile of ships horn when viewed across from side to side, one side to the other side. Why is the water plane area view is the plan view of a ship's horn? These three views are very important for us when we are working. Longitudinal, transverse, water plane area view. Good. So, still with these three views, now we see the bottom. The bottom most part of the hall, as we see here, bottom, is the bottom. We already mentioned it when we were looking at the double bottom. So that's the bottom of the ship. Then the keel, you see the primary structural member along the center line of a ship's hall at the bottom. So at the bottom, right here on the center, the structural member there, there is referred to as the keel. So the keel is at the bottom, but it's a specific structural member. I think you get it. Then we come to deck. A floor of a ship. See, as we are in your house now, or where I am sitting, you are sitting on the floor. On the ship, right, that floor like structure will be referred to as a deck. See, so you see, the main deck is the uppermost deck exposed to the weather. So this floor-like structure, which we call a floor, we rather call it a deck. And the one which is exposed to the weather, which we go on top first before we enter the rest of the ship, will then be referred to as the main deck. So this is a deck, and this is the main deck exposed to the weather. Then we have ship size, of course, we have talked about already. And then we have the step. 
the, the foremost structural member at the bow of a vessel. Just like we saw the keel as a main structural member at the bottom of the center line, the fore end, this structural member here, then will be referred to as a stem. All right? Next, we have port side, starboard side. When you are standing behind a ship, right, you are looking at the transverse view. All this portion will be port side, and all that portion will be starboard side. So that if you are looking at it from the plan view or the water plane area view, you see that this is the center line going forward to aft. And it divides the ship into port side and starboard side. Does that make sense? So this is the port side and this is the starboard side. And you see the left side of the ship when looking from behind. So it is when you are standing here and you are looking, your left side will be port, your right side will be starboard. And that defines the port side or the starboard side. If you come and stand in front, it doesn't change the definition. If you come and stand in front, then it means the starboard port side will not be on your right. The starboard will not be on your left. But the definition is based on when you are standing at the back. Once it has not been defined, it remains so. It be, right? And the port side normally will have a coat of a red. The starboard side will have a color green, as you see. So if you see an aircraft coming or uh, flying, you notice that, especially in the night, you see uh, red and green flashing light. The port side means the left side, which is the red, then the green side will be the starboard side, which is the green. The same code in the standards which are used in ship. Then we have the water line. It says that a line drawn to show where the hull of a ship reaches the surface of the water. So this line, which separates the below water surface or the air surface, it refers to as a water line, right? And you see the maximum possible water line is referred to as a summer load line. We shall talk about it later. But as the maximum water line will be the summer load. But the water line at any time is where you see the air side separated from the water side, so to speak. Next, we have the baseline. See, a horizontal line drawn at the lowest point of the hall, which is used as the datum or reference for defining heights or points. So this is an imaginary line, we say baseline. If the ship were should, should, to be sitting on the street or in the dry dock, then that imaginary line defines the baseline, all right? It is the baseline from where you measure height, all right? So that when you see the draft is measured from the baseline or from the water line, whichever one is above you. And next we have the center line, which we have just talked about. The line which when you are looking at it, the plan view, divides the ship into two symmetrical views, port and starboard. If you come here, the center line is here, port side, starboard side. All right. All right. Okay. So these are uh, various reference lines also, which we define to help in our way. Next, we have, in this isometric view, we have what we call forward perpendicular and half perpendicular. The forward perpendicular, see, a perpendicular drawn to the water line at the point of intersection of the stem in the summer road line. We will explain that later, but we have to go back and forth. First of all, we have this imaginary plane which is drawn to intersect the water line and where they meet is referred to as the forward perpendicular. We'll see another picture very soon. When we have the same thing done at the arms, we say half perpendicular. And then in between the two, the imaginary plane then will refer to as a ship. So let's jump ahead and come back. Sorry. I want to jump ahead and come back because I think we don't have a, a picture I'm looking for. Just a minute. Uh -huh. It's rather jumping back instead of going forward. I should jump, jump back. Okay. So when we come back to this where I was defining the port and stop, 
you can see that from the aftermost point of the ship, from is there to the forwardmost part of the ship, we have what we call length overall. So when we see a 200 meter length ship, then the length overall is from the foremost point, anything which is there, you see, length overall. All right. And then from the definition of the forward perpendicular and the after perpendicular, if we go back, we can see the here. This is the water line, which is the maximum possible water line for the summer load line. The marginal plane, which is drawn to intersect this point, is referred to as a forward perpendicular. And when it is done at the aft, it is referred to the aft perpendicular. So now, instead of the length of our we have what we call the length between perpendiculars. And they are running between the perpendiculars for and aft. So now we go back. This is the length of our from the aftermost point to the foremost point. And then the, between the perpendiculars, we have the length between perpendiculars. So now let's see if we can further understand it. The forward perpendicular, therefore, is a perpendicular drawn to the water line at the point of intersection of the step and the summer dot line. And the half perpendicular is the perpendicular drawn to the water line at the point where the half sides of the rudder post meet the summer load line. Where no rudder post is fitted, the center line of the rudder stock is used as reference. We shall see further details of it further on. So the length of a row, as we have said, is the length of the ship period. That is the length when you are coming to port, they will reserve for you so that you can fit into the bed. Otherwise, you may jump other ships. So that's your length. Now, when we talk about the length between perpendiculars, there is a length between perpendiculars. And as you can see, it is the length on the water line. And the displacement of a ship is based on the length of the water line. So that will be the length we are actually be using in all our calculations, which I'll be following very soon, or in the naval architecture course. The length overall, as I said, is for perfect purposes. And the length between the particular, the length of the water line which finds out for the space, which I get used to. All, all these definitions, there are so many, so we shall be coming back to refer to them to that place of the standard. Length overall, length between the particulars. Length between the particulars, sometimes, therefore, we just simply write L, that means it's understood. So now, going back. Halfway between the perpendiculars is what we define as midship. So midship actually is not halfway between the length of a row. This is rather the length between perpendiculars. That's what we define by midship. And it's represented by this symbol, a circle with these two back-to-back -back, uh, curves to illustrate. So instead of writing midship, 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 long sentence, can just draw this symbol to represent this sheet. This one for half perpendicular, FP for four perpendicular. So that is the definition of those things. So this is midship, four perpendicular, half perpendicular. All right. So it says an imaginary plane represented by a line drawn midway between the perpendiculars. That is the midship. It's a mouthful, I know. There will be so much you cannot absorb today, but the notes are there, and as we go along, we come back to help us to understand. All right. Next, we move to definition of displacement, volume of displacement, and the others. This we are taking from physics, which you know already, right? Displacement is simply the mass of a vessel and all it contains measured in ton. Where, where is the concept of displacement? And I say, this, let's say this is a ship, right? Floating, I mean, hanging in air, it has its weight. This is uh, supported on the scale. And this is the ocean. It's sitting innocently there. If we were to drop this ship or immerse this ship up to this level into the water, then it will displace an equivalent amount of that volume. And that equivalent amount displaced, if we were to remove the ship back, then that measured some displacement. I think this we know already, so I don't need to label it. 
all right another way of looking at the same thing is that right ship is sitting in air the whole material of the steel we call the lightweight and the cargo which we can put into it we call the dead weight right if we were to put therefore the hull only to the ship just like we are demonstrated earlier by the top pictures it will displace this gray shaded amount of water and that we refer to as the light displacement because it's displacement caused by the light weight of the ship only which is the hull. if on the other hand we put the weight inside and dump it or immerse it to the water there apart from the light displacing the green the red which is the weight of the cargo also displaces the blue amount or the light blue amount to give us a full displacement and so the displacement additional displacement which is caused by the weight is called the debit parry go ahead is it yes what did you say? Go ahead. I can't hear you. I didn't hear you. So you can't hear you. The line is breaking. The line is breaking. Oh, okay. Could you hear you now? You can still see the slide. Could you hear me? It was. Yeah. The slide is not clear. Can you hear me now? It's not very clear. It's not very clear. Is that an average? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it not clear? So what I'm saying is that maybe I put my mouth away from the microphone. Sorry. Okay. So I'm saying that the black line represents the steel, which is the hull, the bare hull. We call it the light weight. All right. If the light weight were to be immersed in water. It will displace this amount. So we say light displacement. If we were to put weight into the light, that is equivalent cargo we want to carry, represented by the red. Then if we put the light plus the red together into the water, then we can see that we have displaced some amount of it by the light steel, and there's the additional one by the cargo. So that is placed by the cargo specifically then is referred to as the dead weight. See, so the dead weight is the actual cargo carrying capacity of the ship. It is the amount which will earn you profit. All right. So let's go back now and define them. Displacement is represented by this triangle symbol. And it's said to be the mass of a vessel and all it contains measured in tons where one ton is equivalent to 1,000 kilograms. That's the SI unit for weight. One ton is equivalent to 1,000 kilograms. Then we have following displacement, which is represented by an inverted delta. See, this symbol is called delta. When it is inverted, it's called inverted delta. So that represents volume. So the volume of water displaced by a vessel measured in meter cube. See, so this volume we see inside here is the meter cubed volume, all right? And in terms of mass, when it is multiplied by the density, given mass displacement, all right? The light displacement, we say, is the weight of the steel hull only, all right? And therefore, it's represented by delta suspect L to represent light weight. So you see the mass of a ship has built including mass of water in the boiler, mass of jacket cooling water in the engine, and mass of lubricating oil in the sump of the main engine, all to the working level. These fluids have been added to the lightweight of the ship because they, in a way, constitute part of the engine. Without water in the engine, it will not work. So the water in the engine, not the water reservoir in the story tank, that inside the engine jacket only. The lubricating oil in the engine only when they are added to the steel that is what is defined as a lightweight all right the dead weight as we see is a way to add to the lightweight to give you the displacement so the difference between displacement and light displacement delta minus delta light 
is equal to the third root. All right. The volume that one is inverted, but when we are using the delta, there is mass a top. Then we finally have this coefficient, which is measuring the dead weight to the displacement. If you divide the dead weight by the displacement, then you have what we call dead weight coefficient. Displacement is in tone, dead weight is in tone. So dead weight coefficient is a figure without units. It is displacement, it's mass beat, but it's a figure. So when I say dead weight coefficient is 0.9, what would you say? If I say dead weight coefficient is 0.9, what does it mean to you? Quick question. If I say dead weight coefficient is 0.9, what would you say? How would you, what does it mean? Anybody? Anybody? Is the ratio of the weight to displacement? It's 0.9. What does it mean? Yes, it means 0.9, but what does it mean? What it means is that 90% of the weight is cargo. Isn't it? 90% of the weight is cargo. So that makes that shit very efficient. Isn't it? But if I give you a dead weight coefficient of 0.6, then it means 60% of the weight is only available to carry cargo. Or the cargo is only 60% of the weight. I, I think you get a picture. Do, do, do you get a logic? Uh -huh. The higher the dead weight coefficient, the more weight, therefore, it can carry. And therefore, the more profit it can make. You see? It's like the, the cargo truck it goes to carry cement for the harbor. The more cement it can carry on the trip, the more profit it can make. So if the truck itself is light and it can carry 20 tons, then it will make more profit. But if the truck itself is already 10 tons, then it can only carry 10 tons and then it can make less work. So this is the logic. All right. So it's not just a figure, but the figure has a logic behind it. That's what I wanted you to understand. Okay, we're moving ahead. Now, still on the definitions, we have the breadth. All right. And you can see from here, breath molded. You see, the hull of the ship has a thickness, isn't it? The same plate we used to build the ship has a thickness. So when we have built the ship and we are measuring the breath on the inside, then we say molded breath. But if we go outside and measure the breath, then we say breath stream. So that's the difference. All right. Okay. Molded on the inside, extreme on the outside. Then we come to depth. The depth is measured as the ship side from the baseline to the. The depth simply means the height of the ship as you see it when it's sitting in the dry docks. So that is it. The total height, which is not floating, is sitting in the dry docks. All the way will be the depth of the ship. If it is done on the inside, then the gear, that will be the molded depth. And if it's done on the outside, then it will be the extreme, just like we did with the breath. So also we come to the draft. Draft is the depth of the water, which we do not see normally. See, the depth of the ship is below the water, from the bottom most part up to the water line. If it is measured on the inside, then it is molded. And if it is done on the outside, then it will be extreme. So you get a picture. Draft, depth, breath, very important. Next, we go to the load line markings. We have been talking about the summer load line, summer load line, summer load line. Right? That is the maximum draft that the ship can float at when it is carrying its full dead weight. And to ensure that nobody defeats his purpose or goes against it, it has to be enforced by law. So we have a mark we call the load line mark or summer load line, which is represented by a circle with a bar in between and is enforced on the ship's side, port and starboard. So that anytime you load and you reach that line, you stop. That means you have reached your maximum. So no matter what. So what it means is that. A ship can carry more weight than it is actually assigned. 
But for the safety reasons, we don't allow that to happen. Otherwise, people will load the ship all the way up to the freeboard. All right? So we are only allowed to load to the summer load line by means of this load line mark. That is what we see there. Mark to indicate assigned freeboard, assigned. That is the maximum draft to which a vessel is allowed to go. Even though you can go more, we are only allowing you setting so that you don't overdo things, you don't overload, you see. And therefore, the distance between the load line mark above and the deck is then referred to as a free board. Free board, therefore, is the vertical distance measured at the ship side of the ships between the summer load line and the free board deck. The free board deck being the blah blah blah. But the free board, therefore, is a way of providing safety against sinking in the event of external forces, which we shall understand when we come to flotation and reserve buoyancy. All right. I know it's quite a mouthful, but I'll go through it, and then when we come the next time, we'll go over it again. By that time, you'll have had a chance to read the, the notes in the PDF so that it will make it easier, right? Need to get the fundamentals right for the beginning. Okay, so don't worry if I'm rushing, but just introducing it so that you can get a picture and then we can go over it again the next time to very best keep it and study better. Okay, now with the load lines, you saw that there were some other marks on the site which we have not gone over. That is what we are seeing this one. We leave it for now and then we'll come back the next time. All right. Right. So at this stage, we leave these two out for today's lecture and then we come back when you have read through so that we'll be able to understand it better the next time. So I'll stop here because it's a mouthful.